Many years ago, there was a five-star high school quarterback who was labeled as the perfect NFL and college prospect. He was roughly six foot four, 220 pounds, big, strong, fast, had exceptional arm talent, could run on the ground and run over and run through defenders. Here's the best way to describe it. He was far ahead of his time and he's more of the quarterbacks you see nowadays in 2022. Why was he so highly regarded? It's simple. You didn't see too many players doing the things he was doing on the field. When he was playing high school football in the early 2000s, most of your typical quarterbacks, they didn't scramble a lot and they were just known for throwing the ball. You didn't see all these dual threat quarterbacks like you do nowadays. And even calling or labeling him as a dual threat quarterback might be pushing it. Coming out of high school, he was listed as the fourth best overall player in the the country and the number one quarterback. Everyone thought at max he was only going to play two to three years of college football, go to the NFL, and have a legendary career. Everyone wasn't guessing, but they pretty much knew he was going to be an NFL superstar. Let me put it this way so hopefully you get a better understanding. Nobody in their right mind would have bet against this guy. He was as close to a for sure thing you'll ever see in your life. But when he got to college, things went downhill very, and I mean very fast. He only played one season of college football before getting kicked off of the team and suspended by the NCAA. You want to know the worst part about it? The fact that he had a bright future and a bright career ahead of him because in that one season he did play, he was a starter and he was getting better each and every week. This man flat out ruined his career for something stupid and I can't believe he thought he was going to get away with it. It almost leaves you questioning how smart he was off the field. This all happened in 2006 and even till this day in 2022, there are still unanswered questions and still controversial discussions going on about this man and what went on. So therefore, it leaves us with the main question today. What really happened to Rhett Bomar? What's good, y'all? Hope you're having a good day real quick. We're on the road to 200K, so if you enjoy the content, consider helping us out, helping us get there, reach our goals. And yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. Hope you enjoy. You hate to see it. A guy this talented, this gifted, this special, but yet he threw his career away for one simple mistake. I don't even know if I should call it a mistake because he knew what he was doing was wrong and yet he continued to do it time after time. What makes this story so fascinating, at least in my eyes, is the fact that a lot of people involved in the entire mess are denying what happened. There's a lot to it and you already know behind every story there's a backstory. And to get into this story, we gotta throw it all the way back to where things started. Mr. Bomar grew up in Grosbeck, Texas, and this is where his dad was a high school coach and he helped him out because he was the ball boy for the team. The way Rhett Bomar grew up reminds me a lot of your stereotypical high school football movie. You got the main character, the high school football star, who ironically his dad is the head coach of whatever team he plays for. And that right there was the exact case and example for this story. All throughout his childhood, you know how this goes and I'm sure some of you experienced this. If your dad is coaching a football, baseball, or basketball team, you're going to be around that sport a lot. Therefore, you're going to play it a lot. That's what happened to Bomar, and at an early age, he fell in love with football, and he never looked back. When he got to the age of 16 and 17, he was now the starter of his high school football team. In his first couple of games, everyone thought he had a chance to be really good, but he even surpassed those expectations. You know how sometimes a young player, whether it be in college or high school football, they have a couple of good games and you think they're going to be the best thing ever? That's what a lot of his high school teammates and coaches thought was going to happen with him. They didn't think he'd continue to get better and better. The fact of the matter is, to say he got slightly better every single game may be an understatement. In a video video we made a couple of days ago, we talked about how LeBron James and Zion Williamson were some of the most dominant high school basketball players you'll ever see. Well, that's how Rhett Bomar was for high school football. It went from, oh yeah, this guy, he's pretty good and he's had a couple of good games, to, yeah, this might be the best high school quarterback I've ever seen. I don't even know if me talking does it any justice, but I want you to imagine this. By his senior year, he was listed at 6 foot 4 and 220 pounds. He was pretty much built like a linebacker playing the quarterback position. To go along with his outstanding size, he had phenomenal arm talent. And if that wasn't good enough for you, the most impressive part of his game, at least in my eyes, is the fact that he was a running back in the open field. Imagine trying to tackle a 6'4", 220 pound running back. 
I'd say a great comparison is maybe Derrick Henry. To put it in a better perspective, you know how you can create a dream quarterback in Madden? That's how this guy was. If you had to create a quarterback who was great at everything, it'd be Rhett Bomar. When his senior season came to a close, he was listed as a five-star recruit, the number one quarterback in the country, and the fourth best player in the country. Although he was from the state of Texas, he decided to commit and sign with Oklahoma. It was a win-win situation. Oklahoma was a great program, and Rhett Bomar was a great player. It was a recipe for immediate success. Wrapping up his high school career, listen to these numbers, and this is from around the time 2001 up until 2003. He threw for 6,097 yards and had 58 touchdowns through the air. On the ground, he had over 1,600 yards and had 33 rushing touchdowns. You see it right there, off of the numbers alone, he had an exceptional high school career, and remember, I'm going to emphasize it, this was in the early 2000s. It's been about 20 years and the game has changed dramatically. Back then, it wasn't known as an offensive game. Now it is. Fast forward in time to 2004, Red Bomar redshirted his first year there because the quarterback Jason White, he was still playing. But in 2005, he took over the reins. At the beginning of the 2005 season, he was the backup quarterback and he was sitting behind Paul Thompson. He didn't have to wait long because the starting quarterback, Thompson, had a terrible game where he went 11 for 26 and had a costly interception and a fumble. After that terrible game, the starting quarterback switched over to play wide receiver and ultimately led to Rhett Bomar being the starter. Once he got the starting quarterback job, it didn't go exactly like some people thought or anticipated it would go. It holds true to this day. If you're a five-star recruit, the number one quarterback, yeah, everyone's going to expect you to go out there and dominate like you did at the high school level. I don't think it's ridiculous to put these heavy expectations on all these five-star recruits, especially when you got praised all throughout your high school career. So from a viewer and a fan standpoint, everyone's praising you, yeah, I expect you to go out there and be pretty good. For Rhett Bomar, that didn't exactly happen, and in one of his early starts, he went 12 for 33 and had four fumbles. Maybe having four fumbles in one single game is early jitters for a young guy? I don't know, it's hard to find excuses. However, here's where things start to get good. It seemed like every single week he went out there, he got more confidence and he got better. As a former athlete, I understand it, and I'm sure some of you do too. Confidence and playing better, and goes hand in hand together. The more confident you are, more than likely, the better you're going to play. Not just in college football, but any sport, baseball, water polo, lacrosse, soccer. The more you play, the more comfortable you're going to be with the system. That's how it went for Bomar. One game late in the season, he passed for 298 yards and had two touchdowns against Texas A&M. In 2005 for Oklahoma, he passed for 2,018 yards, had 10 touchdowns to 10 interceptions. Whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. I want you to understand, you see the 10 interceptions and 10 touchdowns, and you think he had a terrible year, but he didn't. Back then, you can look it up or go check the stats for yourself. It was common for quarterbacks to have 15, 10 interceptions and only 15 to 10 touchdowns. All the way up until I'd say roughly 2010 or 2011, you didn't see quarterbacks going out there throwing 40 touchdowns in one season. Today, yeah, it's normal. Back then, it wasn't. A lot of times these quarterbacks would throw a dime and get their team inside the five yard line. And back then, if you were inside the five, you didn't pass the ball. There was no such thing as a goal line fade. I just wanted to make that clear because you do see the 10 touchdowns and 10 picks and you think it was bad, but it wasn't. He also had a completion percentage of 54% back then and wasn't terrible. Everything was looking fantastic for Rhett Bomar heading into next season and one article said he was destined for stardom. In his first season as the starting quarterback for Oklahoma, you saw the potential and you could clearly see why there was hype around this young man. He was a baller and with having one year under his belt, his swagger and confidence only continue to get bigger. Is get bigger the right word to say? I think I meant to say grow larger. You get the point. Not only was he excited for next season, Oklahoma fans were excited, the coaching staff, everybody was wanting to see what he could do in year two. But however, little did Rhett Bomar, the Oklahoma coaching staff and Oklahoma fan base know, his first season there would be his last season. Yes, that's right. You heard me correctly. Rhett Bomar never played D1 football ever again. I don't even think I'd label it as unfortunate because he brought it upon himself. Yeah, it's devastating and yeah, it sucks, but it's hard to feel bad for him. Let's get into what happened and this is the interesting part I'm talking about. During the offseason of 2005, heading into 2006, it was apparent that Rhett Bomar and a couple of teammates got a job. But one day, right before the training camp in 2006, Bomar was 
called into Bob Stoops' office, who is the head coach. If you don't know who Bob Stoops is, I'm not gonna explain it, he's an Oklahoma legend. You may be sitting there wondering, yo Matt, why did Bob call him into his office? It was brought to Bob's attention that Rhett Bomar and a couple of teammates were getting paid to not even show up to a job. Here's the funny part about it, Bob Stoops already knew the answers before he was gonna ask Bomar some questions. I hope I'm explaining this good, let me make it more clear. Bob Stoops already knew that Bomar was getting paid illegally. He was just calling him into his office because he wanted him to admit it to him and he didn't want him to lie. Yeah, I think you know where this is going. Bob Stoops asked him the question, Bomar denied it, and Bob Stoops then showed him proof of it. To put it in a better perspective, that'd be like you robbing a bank and the police want to ask you some questions. You go in for the questions and they say, hey, did you rob a bank? You say no, and then they show you a picture of you robbing the bank on the screen. I mean, what are you supposed to say? You got caught lying. According to the sources, Bob Stoops didn't even ask him to explain himself. He just told him to get out of his office. Do you remember how I told you the quarterback who started over him switched over to wide receiver? Well, ironically enough, that same wide receiver switched back to quarterback and led them to the 2006 Big 12 Championship. I guess you could say it's funny how things turn out. Whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. There's more to it. Here was the official rule that Bomar violated. Quote, unquote, payment over an extended period of time in excess of time actually worked. Listen to this. So Red Bomar, he was filing, like on his papers, for 40-hour work weeks. He was claiming he was working 40 hours a week, which is totally fine. You can work that much if you're a student athlete. In those 40-hour work weeks, it totaled up for $18,000. And that's a large amount of money, especially in 2005. But here's the problem. It was reported that he was only working five hours a week. I think we can all agree that is a pretty big difference. A five hour work week and a 40 hour work week. If that wasn't strange enough for you, things start to get even weirder because the dealership said he never worked for him and they didn't know what was going on. The dealership that was in this big controversy went by the name of Big Red Sports slash Imports in Norman, Oklahoma. I don't know if they're still in business. I'm not going to look it up because it really doesn't matter. At the time, this dealership was a part of the quote unquote Sooner Schooner car program, which supplies vehicles to coaches in the athletic department. To dumb that down, if you don't know what that means, basically to make a long story short, that was the car dealership for the school. They gave the school a lot of their cars. But in an interview after the incident, the dealership said Rhett Bomar or any other Oklahoma athlete hadn't worked at the dealership since March. To go even farther, they said this word for word. Not a single OU athlete has been employed by the new ownership. Unfortunately, we're catching the brunt of the criticism and we have none of the documents or information. We're in a bad situation. The owner followed that up by saying, they're blaming us. We've been there for four months and we're not in any way responsible. If they're mad, they can't be mad at us. Hmm, something's fishy. Going off of those quotes, they're trying to claim and it looks like they're trying to say, they don't even know about Rhett Bomar working for them. Kinda seems a little odd if you had to ask me, but check this out. Coincidentally enough, around the same time, there was also a talented player who went to Oklahoma that went by the name of Adrian Peterson. Coincidentally enough, he purchased a vehicle from the same dealership, but he didn't even finance it. He drove that said vehicle for several weeks and then he returned the car. The Oklahoma program did investigate it and nothing came out of it and they said Peterson didn't do anything wrong. I think that Adrian Peterson part of the story it gives you some vital information. They claimed in this quote that letting a person drive a vehicle without financing or paying it for three to four weeks is a quote unquote normal business practice, right? Well, let me ask you a question. If Adrian Peterson wasn't a star running back and he was a normal average person, would they let him test drive a car for three to four weeks? I don't think so. At that point, it's not even test driving a car, you're renting it. What makes it fishy to me is that you had this same incident happen to two star players within one to two years. I don't want to make any assumptions, but to me, it looks like this dealership, they're big time football fans, and for some of the big time players, they help them out. For Adrian Peterson, they let him borrow a car, and for Rhett Bomar, they gave him some money. Unfortunately, Bomar was the one who got caught. Here's what I think really happened, and I think this is the truth. Bomar grew up in a decent family. I don't think they were rich, but going off of what I've seen, I don't think they were poor. Let's just say they were middle class. So you got Bomar, he's a star football player, and I'm going to say more than likely, he wasn't looking for a job. I believe someone got the dealership, he went up to him and was like, hey man, 
we'll pay you if you work for us, and they agreed on it. And at first, Bomar probably was working maybe 30, 40 hours a week, but then he had to stop because obviously he has football and other things going on. But what didn't stop is them paying him for those 40 hour weeks. His hours were cutting back, but he was still getting the same paycheck. In 2005, they didn't have this name, image, and likeness. Today, he could have got away with it, but back then, it was a big no-no. That's how I think it went down. Let me know in the comment section what you think about it. I'm very curious. Oh, you thought we was done? Not so fast, my friends, like Lee Corso would say. We got a long ways to go. What happened to Rhett Bomar? At this point in time in our story, we got a guy who was the number one quarterback in the country, five-star recruit. He was supposed to be a first-round, maybe a number one NFL draft prospect and now he can't even play college football. He was too young to enter the NFL draft, and he also was banned from D1 football, so he was in a sticky situation. Hey, as people, we mess up, but I'm not gonna criticize the kid too much. He was a young guy and he made a simple mistake. It's not like he was stealing cars and he was robbing people for money. This whatever you wanna call him, car dealership, whatever, they were lending him the money, so it's not like he did some terrible act. Ultimately, with him being in a tough position, he decided to transfer to FCS Sam Houston State. Look, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about his Sam Houston State career because we know how this goes. Anytime you have a five-star recruit who gets kicked out of a D1 school and he has to go to a lesser school, we know they're gonna dominate the competition. There's a reason they didn't go there in the first place. At Sam Houston State, it was much of what we saw at the high school level. He was going out there and completely taking over games. He actually spent two years with the team and when he left he was the all-time passing leader in only 19 games he passed for over 5,500 yards and had 6,100 yards of total offense not too shabby if I had to say so myself and he also had one game with over 500 passing yards after those two seasons with the team in 2009 he would enter the NFL draft where he would get picked up in the fifth round by the New York Giants it is key to note and I want to throw this in there on June 24th in 2009 he signed a four-year contract that had a hundred and eighty five thousand dollars signing bonus sadly though only a couple months later he was waived on September 5th in 2009 he would then pick up and sign with training camps of teams and practice squads including the Giants Vikings and the Raiders sadly on May 14th in 2012 this was the official end to his NFL career and I don't even know if you can call it a career because he never played a down of football oh yeah I kind of forgot to mention and throw in there when he was playing for the Minnesota Vikings he did get arrested for a DUI there's not too much to say about that we know a DUI is bad and he apologized to the team it's not like it had a major effect on his football career but like I was saying that was pretty much the end to it it wasn't all bad though and it's not like he turned out to be some loser in 2013 he became a high school football coach and the current up to date on him is that he's an offensive coordinator at Conroe High School in Texas. Man oh man, you just can't help but wonder, is Red Bomar the biggest what if in college football history? I really and truly believe he's got to be up there and he's in the conversation. I understand Sam Houston State's not Oklahoma, but we saw what he did there. He was fantastic. And even at Oklahoma in the one season he played, everyone was saying, even the articles, you saw it, they said he was destined for stardom. Most of the time when I make these story videos and you guys watch them, what do we normally see? The players who don't see success or they fall off, it's due to stuff that happened on the field. In this case scenario, it's due to something that happened off the field. What if those numbers he put up at Sam Houston State, he did that at Oklahoma? I'm sure he would have been a first round pick, maybe a top three pick. You gotta think about it in 2005, 2006, all these games weren't televised and Sam Houston State, they definitely weren't playing on television. That right there hurt him tremendously because these NFL scouts, they weren't hearing about him anymore. Every time his name got brought up, it was, oh yeah, that's the guy who got banned from Oklahoma and nobody wanted anything to do with them. It's really sad and unfortunate that one simple mistake ruined this man's career. A lot of people felt like too, he had a sense of entitlement where he felt like he could get away with anything. Maybe that's what he did at Oklahoma. I don't know, it's hard to answer because why would he risk millions of dollars in the NFL to get $18,000 in college? And like I stated, from everything I saw, it's not like he needed the money. I don't know, I'm not too sure. There's still a lot of questions I have myself. Let me know your thoughts down below. But with that being said, that's gonna wrap up this video. Hope you guys enjoyed, hope you guys learned something. If you're new to the channel, what are you doing? Join the family, hit that subscribe button and leave a like for more. And as always, let's be great. I'm out, y'all, peace.